Okay, let's get started. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, welcome to our Swingle Clinic webinar series. Uh, it's all in your head. Tonight's topic is depression, presented by Dr. Paul Swingle. And uh, I'll just read you a little bio for him in case you're unfamiliar with Dr. Swingle. Uh, <clears throat> his credentials include a PhD, Fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Registered Psychologist, Senior Fellow BCIA, BCN, BCB. Dr. Swingle can be considered one of the founding fathers of clinical psychoneurophysiology, one of a select few directly responsible for bringing neurotherapy out of university labs and clinics to the general populace in the 1980s. His academic positions include Professor of Psychology at the University of Ottawa, Lecturer in Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, Associate Attending Psychologist at McLean Hospital, Head of the Clinical Psychophysiology Service, McLean Hospital. Professor Swingle was also clinical supervisor at the University of Ottawa from 1987 to 1997 and chairman of the Faculty of Child Psychology from 1972 to 1977. Dr. Swingle is a registered psychologist in British Columbia and is board certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. He is actively involved in research and practice. His numerous publications, including nine books and numerous peer-reviewed journal publications, some of which can be accessed on our Swingle Clinic webpage. And uh, thank you very much again for coming to the webinar. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Swingle. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> so what we're going to do tonight is have a look at the neurology associated with predisposition to depressed mood states. The uh, problem that we have with uh, a lot of these things is that there is just a, a blanket uh, effort to treat people in a one-size-fits-all, that is the use of chemicals, antidepressants, to try to uh, uh, dampen the feelings associated with depression. Uh, the treatments that we do at the uh, clinic and what is proven to be extremely successful is quite the reverse of that. You know, <clears throat> basically you don't want to sedate an emotion. Uh, and we're going to go through a lot of the data on this. Okay. So oh, here we go. One of my favorite cartoons. <clears throat> now, one of the things that they found uh, with antidepressants is that it uh, usually takes a uh, modest situation of depression and turns it into a chronic state. And uh, this fellow, Robert Whitaker, was asked to uh, uh, present a, a, a paper to the uh, working group of uh, U, uh, UK Parliament on uh, trying to understand why we were ha they were having this increase uh, in uh, uh, disability due to mood disorders. And if you look at the data here, <clears throat> this is the United States, uh, the uh, increase in the number of uh, disability mood, due to mood disorders, uh, depression, directly mirrors the increase in the use of antidepressants in the population. <clears throat> there are a number of other uh, countries that found very similar stuff, <clears throat> that uh, uh, increase in mental health disability simultaneously with marked increase in persons on antidepressant medications. Now, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, what I'm interested in this particular slide is if you look at the top uh, uh, data there, <clears throat> Uh, this is a study that was done on uh, effectiveness of uh, antidepressants. And uh, at the end of a year, the number of individuals who were in better shape was very, very minimal. And uh, they found the same thing for uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, they did similar sorts of things. 
And if you do not medicate a depression, it has a timeline associated with it. Everybody gets depressed. And uh, the bottom line is allow it to happen and let yourself work through it. <clears throat> uh, as soon as you start uh, suppressing dampening emotions, you, you're uh, narrowing, narrowing the window of uh, your experiential life. Now, <clears throat> interesting, interesting data on this. Uh, one of the things that happens uh, uh, occasionally uh, when uh, an individual comes down with a chronic uh, depression is that it uh, converts into a bipolar condition. And the bipolar condition is marked fluctuations between uh, frenetic feelings and seriously depressed feelings. Now, if you look at the difference between individuals who have been medicated during, you know, before there was a conversion to bipolar versus those who were not, you can see that the ones who were exposed to uh, antidepressant medications had uh, roughly twice the probability of uh, uh, their disorder converting to uh, bipolar. Okay. Now, if you don't do anything, what you tend to find is this. And these are data that have been replicated over and over and over and over again. Uh, the number of individuals that remit uh, with an unmedicated depression, about uh, after a month, about 23% people remit their symptoms. After six months, it's uh, again, roughly double that, 67%. And by the end of 12 months, 85% are in remission. 15% have a continued problem, and they are, are in the more critical uh, uh, stages or uh, forms of, of depression. So this is something we always, always want to keep in mind, that if you can modulate your depressed mood state without an antidepressant, you're far far better off. Now, unfortunately, in our culture, we've got into the uh, situation of everybody wanting a happy pill. Uh, there are an enormous problems associated with that. Uh, in some circumstances, if you medi medicate a condition with an antidepressant, you create a problem for life. And I'll go over some of these data with you. And, and excuse me. We'll also talk about the neurological conditions that uh, are associated with predisp predisposition to these kinds of states. And what we do in neurotherapy, of course, is uh, modify the brain uh, activity so that we remove those predispositions. Uh, it's uh, normalizing brain function and brain interactions and so forth. Now, here again, I... <clears throat> want to emphasize that one of the very big problems we have in neurotherapy is the marked number of, of uh, practitioners, often without any clinical experience or training at all, who purchase these one-size-fits-all machines. They put a cap on the person, push everything to a norm, and we get a lot of casualties associated with that. People have been through that. Uh, and, and individuals who don't have the vaguest idea what they're doing, if uh, they happen to, happen to be working with a traumatized client, uh, can be extraordinarily serious consequences. OK. Uh, study in Netherlands, <clears throat> uh, how many people uh, have a second or third epi episode of the depression. Those treated with a drug are far more likely to have more than one episode. 
And if you look at more than two episodes, treated with a drug, 31%, treated without a drug, 13. <clears throat> uh, there we go. Okay. Now, what I the only thing of importance here is that uh, highlighted uh, bottom lo, uh, bottom uh, uh, line there, that the uh, effect of an antidepressant is generally speaking about five percent superior to a, to a placebo. <clears throat> and uh, we again, there's a lot of data associated with that. Okay, so what does depression look like neurologically? And there are a number of forms of depression, and I'll be going over all of these with you. Uh, when a uh, client comes in uh, to the uh, clinic, the first thing we do is do a brain assessment, brain map, and uh, that identifies if we, uh, what form of depression we have. That is, where in the brain do we go to fix it? And is it really depression? And one of the things we're going to be re reviewing in some degree of uh, uh, complexity is conditions that are not depression, that are diagnosed as depression and inappropriately treated. We'll have a number of cases of that. So. <clears throat> Let me uh, go down to the, okay. Okay, the, uh, this is the front of the brain, back of the brain. This is the right frontal preorbital cortex. One form of depression uh, is associated with the right side of the brain, uh, the front part of the brain, the uh, preorbital frontal cortex and the right side being more active than the left. Now, one of the things that can happen here is you can have elevated levels of fast frequency activity, uh, 20 or 30% greater, 15 or 20% greater in the right relative to the left. That's a marker for depression. Anytime you have an activation of the right, more so than the left, and the, there's a uh, increased predisposition to depressed mood states. Now, the right can be more active than the left for several reasons. It can be more active than the left because you have more fast frequency in the right, or the right can be more active than the left if you have a lot of slow frequency in the left, because your slow frequencies is indicated under activity you know, lower activity of the brain. So anytime you get that disparity, either because there's a lot of fast frequency here or a lot, uh, when I say a lot, I mean uh, uh, elevated amplitude of uh, slower frequencies on this side. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the other player in this is the occipital region in the brain. And... <clears throat> In the back of the brain, uh, what we're particularly concerned about there is stress tolerance and sleep. And if you have deficiencies in the back of the brain, it makes you very uh, stress intolerant. So that you're responding to stress much more so than you should be doing. The brain and is uh, in this area of the brain, and it uh, quiets the physiology associated with stressful events. Now, one form of depression we're going to be talking about is not really depression at all. What it is, is a situation in which a person is so anxious that they feel helpless and they... <clears throat> Uh, their helplessness or feelings of helplessness uh, is uh, considered to be depressed mood states, and an antidepressant does not address that issue. So you have people, and, and many of you know uh, folks who have been on 
uh, medications for long periods of time don't really feel it's, it's doing very much for them. And the problem, of course, is they're medicating the wrong problem. Now, the other culprit in this <clears throat> is sitting right in here, the anterior cingulate gyrus. <clears throat> that's an area of the brain that's associated with perseverative thought. Get something on your mind, you can't get it out. And, and uh, we'll be talking about obsessive compulsive disorder and so forth in later webinars. But uh, for our purposes today, if that area of the brain is uh, really hyperactive, then what happens is it markedly exacerbates depressed mood state, markedly exacerbates depression. So there are a lot of things going on here that give rise to the course of a, a depressed mood state. Uh, as I said, everybody gets depressed, and the name of the game is let it happen. <clears throat> and cognitive behavior therapy can be helpful in which you redefine a number of things and how you're looking at things. But and what I'm uh, advocating here is you don't want to subdue it and set it, uh, sedate it. That's not what you want to do. Okay. Now, <clears throat> This is a uh, child who was brought in for treatment of ADD. And we get this so frequently. Uh, the child is brought in, we do the map. <clears throat> there are a number of markers for ADD and he doesn't have any of them. Usually we find on top of the head that there's too much slow frequency or we, <clears throat> excuse me, find in the front part of the brain there's too much uh, of the waveform alpha, okay? Or in the front part of the brain there's too much slow activity and so forth. He's got a minor issue there with uh, elevated uh, slow frequency in the front part of the brain, but that's not ADD. What he does have in spades is that marker that I was talking about in which the fast frequent the fast frequencies <clears throat> are much greater in the right relative to the left. And that's your primary marker for genetic predisposition to depressed mood states. Now one of the things we find with depression with children is what's more of a problem than sadness is lack of interest and motivation. And that is extremely common. It's very frequently misdiagnosed as uh, ADD and very often medicated with a stimulant. Right? The last thing on the planet this kid needs is a stimulant. Okay. So what we've been talking about here is <clears throat> when this side of the brain is more active than that, <clears throat> That's your fundamental marker for a form of, of depression. It can happen in a lot of different ways, as I mentioned. You can have accelerated fast activity over here, much more so than here. That's a depression marker. Or you can have this area subdued somewhat by elevated slow frequency amplitude, which means this side is more active than that. This is the area of the anterior cingulate that I was talking about in which if that's elevated or hot, <clears throat> you get a situation in which the person can't you know, get stuck in terms of something on their mind that can't get it out. The other area in the brain that we're concerned about is the back of the brain. Uh, and there we're dealing, as I said, with issues associated with stress tolerance, okay? Okay, now we do topographical EEGs where we can see these things <clears throat> uh, in the uh, graphic output, <clears throat> the topographs. So this is very f uh, slow frequency, three to seven cycles a second, theta, I'm sorry, uh, theta. And you can see it's, there's a heavy concentration over on the left prefrontal orbital cortex, which means the right 
side is more active than the left. So there's your marker for depression. <clears throat> Anxiety, that's the back of the brain, and we want the ratio of slow frequency amplitude to fast frequency amplitude to be in the range of roughly two. And what this is indicating is there's an excessive amount of fast frequency in the back of the brain. This is beta, 13, uh, 15 to 30. So the, here's a situation of predisposition to depressed mood states and poor stress uh, tolerance and likely sleep disturbance. Anxiety-based depression. Uh, here's a situation in which there's no evidence of uh, any depressed markers. Uh, <clears throat> but what we have is hyperactivity of that area that we were just talking about, uh, elevated uh, activity in the anterior cingulate, and we have a situation of very, very poor uh, balance in the back of the brain between fast and slow activity. So sleep is markedly disrupted and anxiety is quite substantial, very severe. So here's a, a, something we see all the time. A man in his 50s, long history of depression, but that's the diagnosis. He doesn't have any markers for depression. And 30 years on medication and uh, psychotherapy, okay? The culprit here causing the problem is the medication, okay? <clears throat> now you can have the uh, issue of elevated fast frequency in the front part of the brain as well. And that's what we're showing here. Uh, it should be an algorithm. Beta should be the lowest, followed by alpha, and theta should be the highest amplitude. Here we get the, exactly the reverse. And uh, this is a severe form of anxiety in which uh, the uh, individual just cannot figure out how to shut their brain off. And again, standard. Decades of depression. Now, that's the diagnosis of it. It's really a situation of not feeling in control and feeling hopeless. Long-term, multiple meds, et cetera. Okay. So, in other words, you're treating the wrong thing. Okay. And another kid that was brought in with ADD. Uh, and what we're finding here is what we have are what are called trauma markers. Now, when a person is exposed to a severe emotional stressor, there's a pos possibility that they will develop a trauma marker. And what that means is that the brain has not been effective in working through the emotional content of that severe emotional stress. It usually is associated with problems with sleep because ideally you should have one hour of deep wave sleep and two hours of REM, rapid eye movement sleep. That two hours of REM is when the brain does its own psychotherapy, filing and so forth. And if you don't have that, then the brain is not efficient at processing and working through trauma or severe emotional stress, I should say, on a day or night by night basis. That's what's supposed to happen. You have bad news during the day and uh, you go into REM sleep and you, the brain works it through. Now, it doesn't get rid of it. I'm not saying that. You know, you don't forget anything, but physiologically, the brain is designed to help you process stress. Now, <clears throat> how we know that an individual has 
and a uh, been ex uh, has a trauma marker is uh, we measure alpha right on top of the head and we ask the person start eyes open close your eyes for 15 seconds and open your eyes okay and this is what the alpha response should look like okay now uh, oh, I gave you the wrong one. This is what alpha should look like. Now, right in here, this is your alpha. These are your alpha frequencies. And you'll see when this person closes their eyes, the alpha jumps <clears throat> quite substantially. And then when she closes her eyes, it drops like a stone. And eyes closed is coming up. There it is. There's your eyes closed condition. OK. That's a healthy alpha response, and then it'll drop like a rock. There you go. Now, compare that with the trauma. As you can see, and it can't break through. You see little pops there every once in a while. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the number one issue, and if you're going to approach dealing with uh, these conditions of depression, anxiety, and so forth and so on, is you have to look at what the brain is doing. You have to look at what the causes of this. And does, does a person have predispositions for various things? What has the client been exposed to? And uh, what's the sleep like? Uh, is it being processed? Okay. So it is, and all of these things are interacting with one another. Depression is not a, a single kind of condition. Multiple uh, neurological conditions can give predisposition to depressed mood states. <clears throat> Sometimes we really surprise people. <clears throat> Here's a, uh, a woman who uh, came in for treatment, and I said to her, uh, are you having a problem with, a, uh, you know, uh, with your partner uh, uh, interpersonally? And she said, how do you know that? She said, we just discussed getting a divorce. Well, <clears throat> what I have here is what's called reactive depression. Now, I remember we were talking about the right side of the brain being more active than the left. If you find that the reason that the right is more active than the left is because the left has elevated slow frequency, okay, then that's usually considered to be reactive depression. So, you know, if somebody dies, you're supposed to feel depressed. And the brain works it through grief and so forth and so on. If you medicate that, you have a problem for life. I mean, it's that simple. <clears throat> and what she's showing here is she's showing reactive depression. And the reason I asked about the interpersonal stuff is she has an imbalance in alpha frequencies in the front, front part of the brain uh, with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, left being greater than the right. And that usually is a marker for interpersonal strife. So that the person is having some interpersonal issues. It can also be re related to social phobias. Okay. Now this we talked about. <clears throat> okay. So 
any folks have any questions they'd like to ask at the present time before we take on the second half here? Any questions for Dr. Swingle? You can uh, type in the chat too if you're shy. Uh, feel free to, to type and I'll, I'll read out your message. I was just curious in terms of the um, the treatment. So where you said that there might be, say, a predisposition or a genetic kind of predisposition to um, to something like depression, um, is it a, a long-term fix then going through treatment or is that something where you would need to continuously maintain that? <clears throat> That's a very critical question. Uh, for some of the simple forms of ADD, 10 or 15 sessions that we can put at the bed. Uh, for straightforward, uncomplicated depression, sometimes that responds in 10 sessions, sometimes less, actually. Now, we use harmonics. Uh, that is, we give uh, clients things to do at home that help balance the front part of the brain or increase stress tolerance and so forth and so on. Uh, and the bottom line is to get the brain and so that you uh, eliminate whatever imbalance it is. Then you have a maintenance issue. Now, it all depends on what you're dealing with. Uh, I'm going to be 83 years of age in another couple of weeks. And if I'm trying to uh, treat a condition of uh, age-related cognitive decline, forgetfulness and so forth, I'm not going to fix that. I'm, I'm going to modulate it. So there, there's a, it, it's an ongoing thing. I have folks at my age, you know, come six times a year, something like that. <clears throat> the best of all worlds <clears throat> is when we get a, an active little kid who comes in with a simple form of ADD that's causing all kinds of grief, and, and we put it to bed. The teacher, responds to the child differently. We get a lot of uh, parents say that the teacher said, what happened? Uh, and if that's the case, then the school does our work for us in maintenance, maintain, maintaining the uh, improvement. Uh, teacher responds differently to the child, child's more interested, engaged in his work, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> so uh, it's just like going to a gym. You're going to have to maintain it, but that does not mean that you have to come back for treatments. That may be part of the equation, depending upon what we're dealing with. But in general, uh, once we get it balanced and we give you some things to use at home to maintain that, that's it. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that you're going to hear over and over again is a glass of wine is good for this, that, and the other thing. <clears throat> yeah, having a couple of glasses of wine doesn't matter one way or the other. My, um, but there's no evidence of any benefit to alcohol consumption. And you know, the notion that, that a glass of red wine is good for you because of the you know stuff in the uh, in the red wine, uh, a cocktail at night really quiets you down, and a lot of that is social patterning. You know, you come home, put your feet up on the sofa, uh, on the uh, coffee table, have yourself a little drink, and and you know relaxing. It's not the alcohol that's doing it. Okay. One drink can have a quieting effect. Once you're over that, it's negative. Okay. And the heavier the alcohol use, the more problematic. So when somebody comes in and and we see a marker for uh, susceptibility to addiction alcohol uh first question we ask how much do you drink okay so and there are a number of things that we have to get under control if you're going to modulate your mood state during your life and, and alcohol can be a very very serious problem 
And as I like to say to our clients, so one of the real problems we have with alcohol is it works. You can have a couple of drinks, you fall asleep, and, and but that's, you know, that doesn't in, in, improve the depression or the life state. It just means you need more. Okay, so the summary of what we've been talking about with depression is basically any one of these conditions that give rise to the right side of the brain being more active, right prefrontal lobe of the crosshair text, the front part of the brain, the right side of the front part of the brain being more active than the left, or something that's anxiety based. Now, a seasonal affective disorders. Uh, you know, living in Vancouver uh, during the uh, rainy and foggy season and uh, overcast season, everybody is deprived of light. And, and light can be extraordinarily important, and it has to be early morning light. Now, true seasonal affective disorder is relatively rare. It's higher in this uh, area than it is in, uh, you know, Florida, for example. <clears throat> the rate of seasonal affective disorder in the uh, in the South very, very minor. We're up in our region. We're dealing with about six or seven percent. Okay. Now, one thing that people don't realize is that there, <clears throat> it's a seasonal affective disorder. Okay. And season means it's not only fall, but it's also spring. And you get people who become down when spring comes, like right around now. Okay. So <clears throat> the sad symptoms, you know, tiredness, fatigue, crying, depression, irritability, lost libido sleep problems, decreased activity, uh, and the, uh, you become more sedentary, so you tend to uh, uh, eat more and exercise less, et cetera, et cetera. And so when it presents in summer, it's quite different. The uh, symptoms are more commonly insomnia, poor appetite, weight loss, uh, in addition to irritability, difficulty concentrating, crying spells, and agitation. Okay, now, the treatment of these two things are different, obviously. For well, the seasonal affective disorder, <clears throat> you know, we use these light boxes, and uh, uh, at the clinic, we have glasses that have lights around the perimeter, around the rims, so that you put the glasses on before you get out of bed in the morning and you leave them on for about an hour while you're getting ready. And what you're doing is you're walking around with your light box hooked on your eyeglasses. Uh, you don't have to be in a room staring at the, you know, the light box, um, but you can be ambulatory. And we found that enormously effective. Uh, if it's summer, then what we need to do is an anxiety reduction or stress tolerance improvement. It's, so the treatment, so these two conditions are entirely different. Okay. So as I said, the winter blues, uh, true seasonal affective disorder is quite rare. I think it's a little higher than this uh, in our our region. Uh, it tends to be, you know, in the one percent or so down in the, the southern uh, areas. Okay. Now, one of the things we do find is that the factors associated with uh, seasonal affective disorder they're most commonly part of a larger condition. Uh, Poor sleep, okay, is one of the uh, common 
and things that we find. But what's even more common is oversleep. And, and one of the uh, uh, concerns I have with people in my age range uh, is oversleep. Uh, if I uh, oversleep, then and that can be deadly for, uh, deadly is the wrong word, uh, it can be uh, very uh, problematic for somebody my age because what you're doing is you're increasing slow frequencies and that's affecting cognitive processing, memory, you know, memory recall and retrieval and so forth. You know, this is T.S. Eliot talking about April is the cruelest month. And the uh, springtime exacerbation that we uh, were just talking about. So, uh, we get uh, exacerbation of, uh, of uh, depressed or bipolar conditions. We get the more manic side of it <clears throat> uh, coming up. So it's um, more anxiety-based as opposed to uh, the uh, fall time. Okay, so the people that are most uh, affected by seasonal affective disorder in the fall are the ones that have what we've been talking about, and that is the marker for depressed mood state, predisposition to it, where the right is more active than the left, they're more vulnerable to uh, uh, seasonal affective disorder, uh, the fall version of it. <clears throat> and and uh, high leg left frontal beta, that is more of an anxiety prone uh, predisposition in the brain, uh, that's the spring vulnerability. Okay, now there are some other theories associated with all of these things, and I'm not suggesting that we don't pay attention to other things and, uh, beyond neurology, we do. Uh, a lot of people who are just feeling lonely and uh, down in the dumps and so forth, and they see all of the flowers blooming and everything coming to life, and they really feel like they're being left behind. So uh, there are psychological aspects to all of this, and, and neurology and neuro, uh, neurolog neurotherapy is not a standalone discipline. So that whenever we're doing our uh, neurotherapy for our clients, there's also a counseling component to that. It may be very, very brief, uh, but nonetheless, we are attending to the uh, psychological components. One of the things that we find very critical when we're uh, working with uh, kids, uh, our family dynamics, uh, the family, you really have to pay attention what the family dynamics are in terms of uh, the problems the child is having. So and this was a situation in which a mother brought two, her two children in, both of whom were diagnosed with ADD. So the first thing I see with uh, Jane, seven-year-old, is that she's got a trauma marker. And she has it at both places. She has an extremely mild uh, attention uh, component where there's a mo modest elevation of slow frequency in the front part of the brain. It, that was, is very trivial. Uh, we could probably take care of that kind of problem in five or eight sessions, something like that. But that's not what this little girl's problem is. This little girl has a trauma marker, okay? Now, what about her brother? This is nine-year-old Martin. Same thing. He's got a trauma marker at both locations. His ADD marker, again, there's a mild one there, but it's peanuts, okay? And he also has an irritability marker, but that, you know, would give rise to uh, uh, teachers uh, uh, reacting to him in a somewhat different way. I asked 
uh, the mother, if she would mind if we did a map on her. Trauma, trauma, severe marker for depression. And, and I asked the woman about this and she broke down and started to cry. There was a very, very serious rift in the family. It had been problematic for a long period of time. Her husband was one of these ragers, so very irritable and uh, quick to lash out and so forth. The other thing that's important is, you know, uh, children of depressed parents, the mother in particular, develop problems. And we have a lot of data on that. Uh, and when a mother is depressed like that, she's not emotionally available to the child. So uh, we could treat these kids for ADD till the cows came home. And that's not their problem. Fortunately, Mr. Kelly was an agreeable guy. At least I thought so. Uh, He's got a severe marker for uh, marked elevation of a waveform in the front part of the brain that gives rise to emotional lability. He's all over the place emotionally. He snaps out at people and uh, things of that nature. So uh, he had a long history of uh, 20 years of, uh, well, he was on antidepressants, but a long, uh, and uh, any anxiety meds, and a long, just a long history of uh, that kind of uh, 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 behavior in the family, and he was aware of it, you know. So here's a very interesting situation of the diagnostic strength of having a look at brain activity. And based on that, and getting a handle on what's going on in the family, getting a, a handle on, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what sorts of things may be sustaining or eliciting the predisposition. Now, one of the things that is important is we're talking about clinical data here. We're talking about people who are having a problem and come to us to fix it, okay? Predisposition to depression doesn't mean you're depressed, okay? So a lot of people with a predisposition to depressed mood states walking around happy as a clam. The reason is nothing has turned the key to evoke it, okay? Okay, so and these are the areas that we've been talking about. <clears throat> uh, the two frontal areas are associated with the depressed mood state markers, where the right is more active than the left. The center part here is a, a factor of uh, 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 sustenance and perseverance and perseveration of a uh, particular mental state. Back of the brain is stress tolerance. <clears throat> CZ is over the motor cortex, and uh, you know a lot of the ADD stuff takes place up there. Okay, any questions? Anybody have any questions for Dr. Swingle? Um, so you've got quite a lot of data on the efficacy of um, medication. Do you have any similar data on um, treatment for neuro neurofeedback and um, and how effective that is as well? I'm sorry, do I have any data on? Just uh, to, as like a comparison. So we we were looking at um, to say you had the data before on um, recurrent uh, depression for those that were on antidepressants. Um, do you have similar data for those that have undergone um, neurotherapy or biofeedback treatment? Oh, yeah. We have thousands of cases. And I uh, put out a, a book uh, 
uh, adding neurotherapy to your practice for uh, clinicians. And, and all of that is based on, uh, uh, all of that is based on <clears throat> uh, the data that we get uh, uh, in the clinic. And I'm not the only one gathering data. You know, there are a lot of people who are gathering data. Uh, and there have been uh, clinical trials in which, uh, you know, trying to compare people on uh, antidepressants with uh, uh, people uh, doing neurotherapy. Uh, One of the things we find is person on antidepressants, uh, neurotherapy takes three times as long. Okay. So that you have to wean down off of that stuff. And some of it is very unforgiving, very unforgiving. Now, I worked with some of the greatest psychopharmacologists on the planet when I was at Harvard. And every one of those guys uh, and, and uh, uh, women, uh, their use of medication was to get a person from place A to place B. Okay? If somebody's highly suicidal, you may consider antidepressants. Short term, get the person over that hump, then you do cognitive behavior therapy or neurotherapy or whatever, as long as the person knows what they're doing to get the person in a non-medicated state and able to maintain themselves. So I don't have a knee-jerk reaction against it. I have a knee-jerk reaction against one size fits all and give the person a pill and go home. And so when you were looking at that timing then, so somebody might uh, respond, say, to a medication within a couple of weeks, whereas with neurotherapy, it would be a number of months. Is, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, my phone just rang. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question, please? So, so one of the one of the differences would be um, potentially that if you were on medication, you might see a response, as you said, like a, a short-term intervention, where it would kick in within weeks, whether, whereas with neurotherapy, it would take potentially quite a bit longer before they would start to feel or see any sort of changes in their behavior. No, often we get a much faster response with neurotherapy by a long shot. Okay. And one of the things I wanted to uh, offer to you folks, if you contact uh, uh, Colin, who's uh, emceeing this, uh, he can make available to you one of our harmonics. It's called Serene Sweep. Uh, and you need headsets for it, uh, eyes closed, seated, keep the volume low. The instructions are in it. And uh, if you give Colin a call, he can give you a free download of that. Uh, you use it two or three times a day for about two minutes each. And that balances the front part of the brain. A lot of people find it very relaxing. You use it as much as you want, but daily use for uh, two or three times for two minutes can have profound effect on depression. You know, the notion that uh, this has to take a long time, a lot of the one-size-fits-all people are, are responsible for that. They talk, they have a package, you know, for X number of thousand dollars, they'll give you 40 treatments, okay? Without exception, they don't know what they're doing, period. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? We don't have any messages in the chat so far, so um, feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll uh, conclude here in a second. Okay, thanks very much for sitting in, and I hope you got a little something out of it. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to our webinar. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me at the Swingle Clinic, uh, you can contact us 604-608-0444 or email reception at swingleclinic.com. Uh, also, check out our Facebook page if you haven't already for more updates and uh, links to the webinars and uh, groups that we're offering as well. Tomorrow we have a group going on at 6 p.m. If you're interested in, in joining, feel free to reach out. And uh, thanks again, everybody. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.